This morning I'm going to read out of Esther chapter 7. So, king, so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. The queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we were merely sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would, be, would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Who is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Queen Esther, uh, Esther said, the adversary, the enemy, is the vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 75 feet high stands at, by Haman's house. He had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Hang him on it. So they, so they hanged uh, Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Father, we... Uh, we praise you for your word, praise you for uh, your spirit, pray that uh, the spirit would move in our hearts this morning as we, as we look into uh, Esther and as we see just all the ways that you have moved in her and in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, happy Super Bowl Sunday, Chiefs Nation, woo woo, yep, I know there's haters out there, don't get too riled up, okay? Uh, don't worry if you're, if you're, you know, we're, we're not going to be all about football and chiefs this morning. Um, but uh, in our narrative, we, we are getting ready to see someone have to step up and perform. Have you ever been there? Have you ever uh, been in a place uh, where you had to get ready and, and step onto the big stage and perform? And it could be music, it could be a theater. It could be a, a huge test, uh, or sports, or, or a lot of things. For me, um, it was sports. It's the, the butterflies, right? That, that, that time where you, you feel your stomach kind of turning over, and you feel like you may just on the verge of getting sick, but you're, because it's because you're excited, and you're nervous, right? Uh, for me, that was, that was in football, that was in, in wrestling. I wrestled in high school, played football in high school, and, and in college, and I always remember especially back in my college, uh, we would go out to the field about oh, quite a bit. I was always out on the field quite a bit early because I was a long snapper, so I was always out with the, the kickers and punters, and then I would warm up with the linemen. I was a center, uh, and then we'd go back to the locker room, and this was the worst, this was the worst time because you go back to the locker room, and you'd sit. And you're like 10, 15 minutes before game time, and you're just pacing. You're just, just pacing, and the butterflies are going, and the adrenaline's up, and you're, you're your, uh, your heart rate's up and your breathing's up and everyone's just on edge. At that moment, you could play on concrete. It would not matter, right? You're just ready to go. You've been preparing all week long. You've been watching film. You've been pr practicing. You're ready to go. For, for me in high school and, and wrestling, it was always fun, that, that moment, uh, because we, we'd always, we always kind of prepare and lead, in, lead into it. Our coach would, would pull our team aside. There's 13 of us, there were 13 weight classes at the time, and we'd pull us aside about, about 10 minutes before time to start, and, and we would, uh, he would speak to us a little bit, Coach Welton, and then our captains would speak to us, and we'd, we'd get ready, right, get, get each other pumped up, and we had these warm-ups where we had the, uh, the dark chocolate brown uh, bottoms, and then we had a, a white hoodie and a dark chocolate brown hoodie, that, uh, like nylon shell that would go over the top of that, and we'd put both those hoods up down low over the eyes a little bit, right? Try to look intimidating. 
And we would all run into the room, to the gym at the same time. Uh, we'd line up lightest to me. I was the heavyweight. We'd line up from lightest to heaviest. We'd choose a mat and we'd jump out and we'd circle the mat like four or five times. It didn't matter who was on the mat. That was our mat. And we would, we would take over and we'd circle and we're just getting ready. Um, that moment is, is just electrifying. There are moments like that where you have to prepare for something big that are not quite so electrifying, that are harder. Maybe you've been in one of those where it's a, it's a hard conversation you have to have with somebody, something you have to face, a, a, a person, a family member, a son, a daughter, a parent, a coworker, a boss, where you know that you're going to have to speak into them or, or bring something up that's going to be hard and you've been preparing and and worrying about it and praying over it and asking others to pray with you for the right things to be said and for the right thing to happen. Those butterflies are just fluttering inside you. If you were here last week, you might remember that we left Esther in that moment standing on the throne right in front of the king. See, in the last three weeks that we've been through this series in Esther, we've seen the the Jewish people, including Esther and Mordecai, uh, trapped in exile in Persia. Uh, We have seen uh, them facing the chaos of of this narcissistic, um, kind of playboy, insecure King Xerxes. We've seen him deal with the injustice uh, of the hatred from Haman towards their people and, and the hopelessness of a decreed annihilation. And something must be done. Only King Xerxes has the power to do anything about it. And we see Queen Esther there on purpose, for this purpose, before the king. What allows a person to have the courage to be in that place, the courage to to face that hard thing? What allowed Esther to stand before the throne in front of the king? It's because she knelt before God first. Past preparation matters. See, Esther didn't go to the king, go to the throne without preparing. And we talked a little bit about this last week. We're kind of continuing right where we're at from last week. Uh, And this this verse out of Esther 4.16 says, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When it is done, I will go to my king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. We keep coming back to that verse, but the importance of it can't be overstated. Because the contrast of how she goes to King Xerxes now versus how she went to begin with is pretty dramatic. If we go back to Esther chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 9, 10, and 15. It says, uh, she's speaking immediately of Haggai, the the eunuch who's in charge of the king's harem. It says, she pleased him, Haggai, and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Verse 15, when the turn came for Esther um, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her, including the king. And she became Queen Esther. Now here's the deal. Her preparation the first time, was about becoming like the society. She she conformed to the Persian culture in order to prepare for trying to be queen. And and we praise her for being there, you know, uh, on purpose for purpose, and uh, Scripture says she was for such a time as this. And and she says she's faithfully there. But the reality is, As a Jewish person, she should never have been hidden within the culture. God said for the Jews to be set apart, to be holy, 
to stand out from the other places. She wasn't supposed to blend in. This time, this time is different. The first time she feasted for months, they brought her the, the prepared food and, and they gave her the right beauty treatments. This time it's three days and three nights of no food and no drink. Before she comes looking like a queen, this time she comes looking like a servant. Before she trusted Mordecai, she trusted Haggai. This time she trusts God. See, it was Mordecai's instructions not to reveal her identity. That's what she had listened to, to fit in. This time, it's Esther giving the instructions. She tells Mordecai, you go fast and pray and tell everybody else to fast and pray. And we're going to do the same. And this is how this is going to go down. She doesn't seek wisdom from Haggai. She doesn't seek wisdom from, from her, her Persian court. This time, she seeks wisdom from God. See, the practical application of, of Esther's preparation was fasting and praying, but really, what she was doing was coming back to her relationship with God. See, to have wisdom and courage to stand before the king, she knelt before God, the king, big K, and she came back to the one who had always been there, waiting for her, loving her, both her and the Israelites, moving in her life and moving in their life. It was the sovereign God that she came back to. And here's the cool thing, that you and I get to do the same thing. See, this, this discipline of prayer and fasting, and in all the spiritual disciplines, whether it's reading scripture, whether it is serving, whether it is giving, uh, no matter what it is, uh, it's not about a checklist, but it's about a relationship checkup, right? It's about um, increasing our attention and our affections to Jesus. Preparation is all about a relationship with God, not about how good we are. And in that, past preparation is going to produce present obedience. And present obedience is possible. It's possible for us to be obedient to God now because of a preparation of a relationship with Him. Let's take a look at Esther 5, uh, 1 and 2. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's Hall. Remember we said last week that she didn't come on her, on her knees. She didn't come uh, begging. She came standing. She came confidently. The king uh, was sitting on the royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Esther comes confidently before the king out of preparation, and this time, instead of hiding herself in the culture, she obediently names herself. Esther 7, 4 says, For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. It's the same language Haman used for his decree to annihilate the Jews. And in doing so, she, she openly tells the king, the people that you're getting ready to destroy the people that Haman set for destruction, those are my people. There's power in naming yourself. There's power in stepping into who you are. Uh, in cinema and movies, I think the most powerful moment, um, one of the most powerful like little monologues and moments of seeing someone kind of step into who they are uh, comes out of the movie Gladiator. It's this classic little monologue, and, and whether you like the movie or not, uh, it's so powerful to see um, Maximus, who was a general in the army, who became uh, who was a slave, who became a gladiator. All right, he's got his mask on, and nobody knows who he is. And and the Caesar, who he's against, is down with him in 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 the on the dirt after a victory. He says, "Take your take your mask off. Reveal to us who you are." 
And of course, with cinema, you know, he's got his back turned toward him and he takes the mask off slowly and he turns around to the camera. He says, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix Legions, loyal servant to the true emperor Marcus Aurelius, faithful to a murdered son, uh, a father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. It's that moment, right? The goosebumps. There's power when you, you name yourself, when you step into the identity that God has given you. There is power in that. Israelites were set to be a holy people apart from God, and Esther steps in to who she is. I am Jewish, and right now our people are set to be annihilated. Not only does she um, step into who she is, she also announces who her enemy is. She doesn't just set herself apart from the culture herself, she separates the culture from her by naming the Persian, Haman, who's out to get her. Who is it who's against you? An adversary, an enemy, the vile Haman. Now here's the thing. The king has a decision to make. This is the, the center point of this narrative. Does he support his foreign queen or does he go back to his native second in command? There was a point like this at the first part of Esther. Queen Vashti says no. What's the king to do? At that moment, he went with his buddies, right? He, he listened to the buddies who said, oh, kick her out. This time, this time is different, though. He still has to make the same decision. My queen, who now I just found out is a foreigner, or do I stick with Haman, the guy who's been with me as second in command? I believe out of preparation, out of prayer, out of fasting, God intervenes, and Xerxes makes the wise decision. And in it, a new law is written. Esther 5, 8 through 5, 8, 5 through 8, says, If it pleases the king, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it is right to do, if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all of the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to, the Morde to, to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best for you, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with the ring can be revoked." The old law couldn't be revoked. So a new law is written. A new one was needed for the redemption and resurrection of the Israelites. The old one set apart the destruction. The new one set apart their redemption. Past preparation produces present obedience to bring about future glory. Future glory is Come and this new law is written. And the Israelites defended themselves. The new law allowed them to defend themselves. And over 100,000 people were killed. Like the Jewish people, they went after those who were coming after them. It was a big deal. It wasn't just a small skirmish. Not only that, but in their obedience to their defense, they didn't take any plunder. And it doesn't say, that's like, it says they took no plunder. That's a really small little part of the sentence. If you, don't, if you miss it, though, Saul, clear back, Saul, who is family to Mordecai, remember, he got into trouble because he took plunder. He was supposed to eradicate the Amalekites, who is Haman's family, but he doesn't. 
It takes plunder. And this time, though, they are obedient. They're obedient for their own salvation. And they're obedient to God in the way it was supposed to happen. Esther 9, 20 through 22. It says, Mordecai recorded these events. He sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote to them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving of presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. There's a celebration happening. They get to celebrate. They celebrate because of the immediate future. There's glory in the immediate future, and that is the Israelites route Haman's plan, save their people. And here's the thing. They didn't, they didn't just do it. They were so successful. The power of God in the Jews was so prominent that it says in, in Esther that, that many Persians became Jews because of it. That's what happens when God's power comes through. It's so visible. When we allow God's power to you to work in us and through us, it is so power, powerful. People will come to God through that. Um, there is also a distant future that gets celebrated in this moment a distant future of glory, and that has to do with Chris, Christ's lineage. It stays alive. Jesus is Jewish, and if we, if we eradicate the Jews, right, it, it negates the promise of God for Christ to come. And here's the cool thing. There's such a parallel between Jesus and Esther. Now, Jesus is, is better. He's more complete. He is the Messiah, but there's this amazing parallel between the two. Jesus, like Esther, is hated and set to be annihilated. Esther was set to be annihilated by a foreign country. Jesus, by his own people. Esther names herself in obedience. Jesus does the same thing to the disciples, to the Pharisees, to Pontius Pilate. He says, I am. I am. I am he, the king. Esther has to go to a king. Jesus is the king. Jesus writes a new covenant. Esther um, had to make a new law that allowed blood to be shed in order to secure their redemption. Jesus sheds his own blood in order to secure our redemption. That's the new covenant. The old law, the new law for Esther, uh, was against the old law. Our new covenant is against the old covenant. Our new covenant in Christ's blood completes the old covenant. And in that death, burial, and resurrection, in that new covenant, Jesus defeats his enemies with, by his resurrection. The redemption of the Jews in Esther was about shedding the blood of, his, of their enemies. Jesus shed his blood so he could even save his enemies. Isn't that amazing? How amazing is our God? How amazing is our Christ? And we get to be a part of this future glory in Christ. Because of him, we are a part of this narrative. We're a part of this story. We're a part of the future glory that happens because of an obedient Esther and Mordecai. Now, here's the cool thing. Jews, they are great at celebrating. I mean, if you look through the Bible, like there is one celebration party after another. And, and I've, I've actually gotten to be a part of one. Um, my wife was a nanny in Connecticut for a year for a Jewish family. And our first year in marriage, we got to go back and uh, be a part of their daughter's bat mitzvah. And I'm talking like four or five, six hour celebration, ceremony, party, dancing, um, like, like pre hors d'oeuvres, in hors d'oeuvres, and all kinds of crazy food, amazing meal. 
This will tell you just how it went. I'll, the desserts. Twelve eight-foot tables of imported Belgium chocolates. That was the dessert time. That ended it. They know how to celebrate. We could take lessons from that. They were celebrating God. We get to celebrate God's glory in Christ. Our celebration is even greater. Like, we should celebrate what we have. We have reason to celebrate. We have reason to celebrate as Christ followers, and I think we have reason to celebrate as a church. We call this day Vision Day, and it's a little bit more low-key than it has been in the past. Um, but we really want to focus on just what Christ has done, um, both through Esther and in Christ and, and through us and, this, and our building and, and everything, right? Our chance as a church to look back, to look at now, and, and to look ahead. In the same way that there was past preparation for Esther, uh, there's been past preparation for us too. Our church uh, started in 1967. I said uh, earlier on in, in December that the very first service um, on, on this site, 1404 East Mary, was in uh, the first building, which was the, the kids' wing. That was the first building on site, or the first uh, worship center, worship sanctuary on site, e at Easter 1971. And as we look back over the history of our church, uh, we see 57 years of Bible Christian Church staying true to its name, holding to the preaching of the Word of God as paramount to who we are. Loving our neighbors, loving those who come through the door of our building with God's love. Over the 15 years that I've been here, I've, gotten, I've had a chance to meet many of you uh, your first time here. And, and as I've met you and as I've met, as I meet others who come through the first time and who come back, what I hear over and over and over again is this. I came back because of the smiles and the handshakes and the friendliness and the warmth that I had when I came through the door. Thank you for that. That matters. Like, that means something for us. We've uh, connected our people in service over the years. We've called each other to obedience over the years. We've worshiped together in community over the years. And that preparation and the obedience then, I believe, has, has produced amazing obedience now, present obedience. When we look at our church right now, where we sit, uh, it's awesome. It's so much fun to be a part of. Connect groups, we push connect groups all the time. We think you need to be in a connect group. Somehow having community is, is, is vitally important. In life groups, Bible studies, and Sunday school classes, all combined we have 146 people in connect groups. We have a Celebrate Recovery group that meets on Tuesday nights. Anywhere from 15 to 25 people who are working on hurts, habits, hangups in community together. Understand, trying to understand how, how God's redemption can work in their life. Mops meets every other Tuesday. Mops is mothers of preschoolers. And we've got 60 plus ladies who will meet. And I don't know how many kids they have. Like, it's a lot. There's a lot of little kids running around here on a Tuesday morning. Let me tell you. Awesome. Kids men, on an average Sunday, birth through high school, on an average Sunday, we'll have 121, 127 kids here on Sunday morning. We'll have... We've had up to 109 kids come through, 109 different kids come through our Wednesday night flash program. We've had up to 60 students come through in our high school, middle school program. And then uh, uh, across the street, uh, my wife ha has a preschool. This year we have 23 kids, thir three-year-olds and four-year-olds. We have over 20 kids every year who are hearing about the Word of God through, through their education. Uh, We've had events like, like Fall Fest where we had 800 people walk through our building playing games with each other and laughing and having fun. Easter egg hunts. All kinds of, of awesome events. Baptisms. This past year we've had 20 people uh, give their life to Christ through baptism. 
That's amazing. And, and for us, that's even been a down year, which is, which is awesome to think, like, it's such an amazing number, and God just does awesome things. We had 15 different people come into our partnership class, which we have another one coming up here in, in a few weeks, who said, I want to partner with Bible Christian Church in my faith. And then we have our new building. And it has been um, a blessing from God, and we know it has been completely from God. It, it started because we had an individual come to us. We didn't seek him out and said, I want to buy you this building for a price we never could have dreamed of, of trying to sell it for. We're like, okay, I guess we're going to do this. And, and we did it, and we started it. Uh, we started buying things at the end of a pandemic when prices were sky high. We had no idea what was going to happen. And, and as God does what God does when only he can do things, right as we started buying things, the prices came down and they stayed down. And here in about eight weeks, we plan to be in it. And yeah, it's exciting. It is exciting. Um, and we've said it's a tool, it's not a temple, and we're going to use it to do amazing things for God. It's good to be excited. You might see me walk around kind of giddy once in a while, just kind of bouncing around a little bit, because um, I'm, I'm looking forward to be there. I'm looking forward to see what God does next. That's the fun thing about being a part of a community. When we see God move, we know he's going to move again. Like, we get to be a part of him moving again and again and again. We get to be excited for that. So our application is, as we look at Esther and, and what he's done through Esther is this. Prepare yourself to celebrate obedience. As we've been obedient and we continue to be obedient, we're going to prepare ourselves so we can celebrate what God does through that. What does our future glory look like? At Bible Christian Church... What's it look like for us moving forward? Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That verse is part of our vision statement, which is to make more and better disciples. It's more and better. I don't think those two can be separated. I think as believers, it is our call to step into our, our discipleship, step into our faith, to grow in our affections and our attentions to Christ, to grow and be better uh, scholars of the word, to, to be better servers, to, to, to be better in the way we communicate the love of Christ to others, to be better in, in the way we are obedient to what God's called us to do. Uh, not just for ourselves, so that we can show the love of God to other people and make more disciples. The way we make more disciples, we talk about reaching our one. Uh, Luke 15, there's three parables that Jesus talks about. Uh, there's the parable of the lost sheep, where the one sheep gets lost and the 99 are left uh, in the field and, and the shepherd goes and finds him. And there's the, there's the one coin that the, the widow loses and she clears the house to go find it. And then there's the, the um, parable of the, of the prodigal son. And the father is waiting, hoping for the son to come back. And when he does, he receives him into his household rejoicing. That's how we're to go after people. That's how we're to call people back in. And I get this every once in a while as, as we talk about more and better and reaching our one. And, and I, I've had people go, you know, Chad, it's not, it's not about numbers. And you're right. There's nothing about how many people are here that will impress God. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. There's nothing, we're, nothing about numbers that impresses God. But there's one person who doesn't know Jesus. And they have no future glory. They have no future hope. And that one person matters to God. And that one person matters to us. And then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. Those numbers, they do matter. The way we're obedient in God's calling to go reach, to be better ourselves so we can reach others, to make sure that our faith is, is personal but not private, that does matter. 
And, and the way we word how we want this to look is, is double kingdom impact in five years or less. By kingdom impact, I mean, are we impacting the kingdom of God? Not are we just drawing other believers who are part of another church and who come here. Now, if that's you, I'm glad you're here. But, but hear me, I, to be here, I want you to be here and in what we're doing. It's not about just coming to church. It's about investing in the, in the partnership that we have with God for what we want our church to do. Yes? We want to have kingdom impact. We want to, to go into our community and to reach people for Jesus until there's no more people to reach. Those numbers matter greatly. Now, being how we are as people, if we don't put a deadline to it, then it doesn't happen, right? So we say five years or less. We want urgency. It's important to do it now. It's important as we celebrate what God's done here, as we celebrate what God's doing across the street, we never lose the fire. We never lose the, the fervor as we prepare and continue to prepare. That's a, this is cyclical. It's not linear. This preparation and obedience and glory is, is, is circular. We're continually preparing. We're continuous, continually obedient. And we, and we get to see glory through that all the time. question for you then is this. For you and for I and for us, are we willing to prepare ourselves to be better, to reach more, and to help create a future that can be celebrated both here at Bible Christian Church and in eternity? If that is what you want, if that's what you want to be a part of, then the call is to step in with us. Right? Step in and be a part of what we're doing. Stop being a spectator if that's you. Be a participant. Be a part of what's happening instead of just watching it happen. And for you, that may be uh, you've been kicking the tires of Christianity for a while and you've kind of held back really accepting Christ. And it's time. It's time to, to, it's time to, to dig in. It's time to, to submit yourself to cut the pride, submit yourself to God, to make the declaration that you believe in Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, as the Son of God, to submit yourself to the, to the waters of baptism as we, as we submerge you in, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Maybe for you, that's, uh, you've been a part of our church for a while and you've never jumped into serving. You've never jumped into actually being a part of what we do. You've, you've enjoyed being here, but now the call is to, to be a part of it. If that's you, if God's working on your heart, submit to that. Jump in. We have places for you to serve. We have ways that you can use your gifts for God's glory so that we can be obedient as we move forward. I don't know where you're at or, or where, what God is working on your heart this morning. I pray that you would use the seats where you're at as we sing here in a minute. As, a, as an altar, as a place where you come before God in this time of ministry. You can use the seats, you can use this, this stage. Fall to your knees. Bow your head. Submit yourself to what God is calling you to. Submit yourself to what the Holy Spirit is convicting of your heart. And then celebrate it. Like be, ex be excited for what God's doing here in you and what he has plans to do in the future. Let's go ahead and stand as a pray. Father, we, uh, we're so grateful for um, your redemption, for your resurrection, Christ. And, and you, you did that for us. You, you came, you submitted yourself to, to this planet, to the, to the laws of physics, to this body. You submitted yourself to the Father. You came and... and joined us in this life and you submitted yourself to death death on the cross you were obedient in the moment so that we could have glory in the future pray that 
as, as you work in our hearts, Father, Holy Spirit, as you, as you move in us, that you would uh, break the walls down, open our hearts up to you, and that we'd be obedient in what you call us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.